So welcome everyone. I'm Bernard Golden. I'll be speaking today about how do you assess and, op and evaluate open source products and uh, presenting the open source maturity model, which is a model that I created around how to evaluate open source products. Um, just to give you a little bit of background about myself to start off, because you might say, well, why are you up in front of us? What gives you the wisdom to uh, talk about this? Um, my background, I've worked in large IT shops, kind of end user organizations, probably like a lot of you work in. I worked uh, for large um, enterprise software companies and then did a little tour through um, one of the big global consultancies as well. So I've had very broad exposure to all the way that IT is created and used. And when I first got exposed to open source software, my immediate reaction was to reject it. I said, well, this can't be any good. I mean, all this stuff, it's put together by volunteers. It's got to be people who can't get jobs, students, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, and I've built big software, and I know how it's done. Well, um, then I actually got a, ha, ended up working on a project where we had to use it. We were brought into a project by a company that had, was doing a, a, a pretty good sized project, and they'd spent all of their budget. And then they said, oh, by the way, we haven't figured out how we're going to get the data from the new system into our back end system. What do we do? So they kind of came to me and I said, well, let's try that. All we've got left is open source because it's free. So let's try that. And what was interesting was we built this thing out of open source. And I have to say that that really was like an eye-opening experience for me. The, the quality was so good. And particularly, the responsiveness of the support was so strong in comparison to my colleagues who were doing the thing with the com commercial software they had bought, I, I mean, really, it was like, I, I just went, why would people stick with that old model when this newer model is available? And so I got very involved with open source, started doing a lot of research, started talking to a lot of people, started doing a lot of writing. And one of the things I concluded was that as open source became more mainstream within mainstream IT organizations, they were going to say, how do we know what the right products are? In other words, kind of my epiphany was I said, most organizations aren't going to say, oh, the way we decide what to put into our production infrastructure is we're going to ask Bob down the hall who heard about a good product. And that's the way most open source has been. You know, oh, yeah, somebody down the hall heard about it and thinks it's pretty good. And you know, my experience with mainstream IT organizations through my career is they don't work that way. They want some kind of process. They want to have an evaluation thing. They want to feel comfortable and confident. They want to reduce their risk. So I created the open source maturity model, which is what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, but before I do that, I'm going to take my sweater off because it's getting warm in here now. I, I don't know how anybody else has had this, but all this morning I've been freezing. The, the rooms have been really, really cold. And I've, I've found through a lot of experience at conferences, if you don't bring a sweater or something, you can end up shivering in the back of the room. So excuse me for just a moment. So let me begin by asking from the audience, by the way, during the of course, the presentation, your question, put your hand up. I mean, really, really, I think interactive stuff is a lot better than, you know, kind of a droning lecture and then, oh, we have time for questions. How many people here are, at, you know, using open source fairly um, extensively within their organizations? So it looks to me like a third to a half. How many are experts with open source? Okay, the guy who runs Open Source Lab. Andre, you, you qualify too. You can put your hand up. And how many people are kind of just getting into it or kind of just a little bit exposed to it and going, oh my god, what do I do? OK. Well, to begin with, we're going to start around open source with the fount of all, of all wisdom, technically speaking. Dilbert. <laughs> and this is a, a cartoon that ran a couple of months ago. Can everyone in the room read it? So the funny thing is, is part of my, where I started my career, I was working for the Pacific Bell, the local telephone company. Scott Adams, who writes this, was in the same building as me. And a lot of this is based on phone company stuff. And I can attest to it. He was in a cubicle uh, kind of at the, in the other wing. What's interesting about this to me is that if it's gotten to the point where Dilbert is making fun of it, 
it's getting into the mainstream. I mean, Dilbert doesn't make fun of stuff that nobody's ever heard of because nobody buy the cartoons. So this tells me that open source is really starting to penetrate and become a mainstream issue. And uh, so uh, I think that that really aligns with what I was saying. As, as open source became more of something that was a mainstream issue, organizations were going to say, how do we evaluate? How do we adopt it? And so forth. All right, well, what is open source software? Well, I've got this uh, picture here. I don't know if you've all heard this story about the, it's an Indian fable, East Indian, where someone takes a number of blind people, blind men, and says, you know, just tell me what an elephant is. And they all go over and they touch the elephant. One touches the tail and says, oh, an elephant is like a snake. It's like a rope. It's long and long. Another one touches its side and says, oh, it's, it's, an elephant is like a wall. And another one touches its leg and says, oh, it's, it's thick and round. It's, it's a tree. It's like a tree. And the point is, they all take their own perspective to, to describe it. And really, open source, in a way, is like that. Some people talk about open source as being a licensing regimen. It's a way that so software is licensed. It is created under a, typically under one of a number of well, very well accepted licenses, although there are many, many more licenses. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of licenses. There's a number that are approved by the Open Source Initiative, which is kind of the good housekeeping seal of approval, but there are lots of other licenses. My favorite is the free beer license, which says, you're welcome to use this software, but if you ever meet me, you have to buy me a beer. And that's a license. Uh, it's a collaborative development methodology. Unlike you know, 15 or 20 years ago where if you wanted to start a software project, you went and got venture capital because it cost you so much money for equipment. And by the way, the only smart people in the entire universe lived within 15 miles of Palo Alto, California. That's all changed. Now people all over the world can contribute. So it's a collaborative development methodology in one way. It's a way to reduce development costs. Um, you know, Linux is a great example. Lots of companies put in some and get out a lot. And so it's a, it's a way to reduce your development costs. Um, some people have built a business model based on, we'll get other people to develop our software for us. I call that the Tom Sawyer model of development. Inexpensive way to distribute software. We'll be talking about this in a slide or two. But essentially, you know, the model of we're going to hire a big sales force and they're going to go pound down the doors for all of you folks and make you buy our software. That world is just dying. And so it's a way to distribute your software that you can send it out and people all over the world will begin using it. It's an inexpensive way to procure software, right? It's available, download it for free. It's very inexpensive compared to the alternative, which has typically been you buy a big software license and it costs you a ton of money. And of course, um, many people focus on it's a threat to proprietary software companies. And frankly, a lot of the discussion in the industry focuses around this. Is this a threat to? Oracle. What does this mean to Microsoft? And while that's all valid, to me, the far bigger revolution around open source is about end users and the impact it's going to have on end users. And I think that's the place that you really have to pay attention. And that's where the big, um, the really big effects will be going forward. Let's talk about some key differences between commercials and open source software. Well, commercial software comes with a restrictive license, right? I mean, essentially it comes and says, you're welcome to use this on this kind of computer of this size or with this many users. And you know, if you say, boy, this has worked out so well, I'd like to use it more, they say, great. Send us some more money and you can use it some more. Very restrictive license. It's a bundled offering. Typically, the vendor takes responsibility for everything, right? They create the software. They're who you have to go to for support. Oftentimes, they're kind of the service mechanism. They, create, they take responsibility for creating the documentation, the training, the whole Megillah. So, you know, really it's kind of the fount of all wisdom comes from the vendor. And in that world, you have very much an active vendor. The vendor takes responsibility for making sure that thing's good enough for you. And as a customer, you're relatively passive. Essentially what you do is kind of say, I'm interested in CRM, for example. Would all the CRM vendors who want to sell me something come and, and educate me? Pound down my door. Do all the work for me. You know, maybe I'll create an RFP, but I want you to do all the work to figure it out. And so the key challenge, of course, is always selecting the right vendor. You know, who are you going to place the chips with? Because once you, once you sign the deal, all the power in the relationship shifts over and basically it's with the vendor. 
I guess selecting the right vendor is a lot easier these days. It seems like Oracle's just deciding that there's only going to be one vendor, and that's the one you're going to have. But um, that's a real uh, challenge. Well, on the open source side, it's a very different world. It's a very expansive license. It gives you lots of rights. You can use as much as you want to. You know, you can, um, if your business changes and you want to put it on more machines, go ahead. You can s redistribute it to other people without having to ask permission. You can even get the source code and change it if you'd like to. So there's, it's a very expansive license. It gives you a lot of freedoms. But the flip side of that is, because of that, it tends to be a, 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 uh, distributed at no cost. You don't have to pay for it. And what that typically means is the people who create the software and distribute it do a lot less of the work for you. So when you say, geez, this is really great, you know, I'm very interested in this software, um, nobody comes and says, let me tell you all about it. Let me give you our vision pitch. Let me show you the roadmap. That doesn't really happen. And so as a customer, you tend to end up being much more active in the process. You have to decide, is this the right product for me? Does it meet my requirements? Is this good enough? So it's a kind of a very different world. And um, uh, I, guess I, was, I guess it was a session this morning I was in where this came up a ton, all about RFPs and stuff like that. Um, I'm trying to. It was in one discussion. And basically, that you know, vendors aren't responsive to RFPs. Yeah, it was in the, um, it was in the Oregon public policy one. How many people were here that, uh, here were in that session? So you, you know that that came up a ton. You know, the problem is it's like you, you send out the RFP and nobody ever writes. And so the challenge with that, and that's a challenge, I think, that's pretty significant within the open source world. Essentially, open source providers, open source vendors kind of say, hey, we make it easy for you. I'll let you use it and figure out if it's right for you. You know, you don't have to depend on me. You don't have to depend on a, um, a software salesperson who's going to come out and, you know, try and convince you and all that. You can do it yourself. And, and they think of that as being a real benefit, and it is, but it also means you have to be more responsible. So the key challenge is always, how do you find the mature product? Um, in a sense, this is adapted from Jeffrey Moore's Crossing the Chasm. How many people here have not heard of Jeffrey Moore's Crossing the Chasm. Okay, well, um, essentially, Jeffrey Moore is a, uh, he's a consultant to high tech companies, and he posited that early stage customers are very willing to live with kind of ragged products because they typically use them to get um, competitive advantage. And so for them, they don't want a product like everybody else gets because then there's no competitive advantage through using it. They, they're willing to live with something much less fit, formed because they bring in their expertise and that enables them to be better off and compete better. He, his point was that when you get into mainstream organizations, they don't want these unfinished kind of ragged products. They want a complete product. They want something that has services available, that's easy to use, that can get their people trained. He calls it the whole product. I call it the mature product. But in essence, it means a, a, a full bundle of stuff. So all the things that you know, mainstream organizations want with a product to make it easy to use or consume. Within the open source world, that's a real challenge because there's no vendor kind of signing up and taking the responsibility for that, typically. And so as an end user organization, you have to say, how do I draw together those resources? How can I figure out what the right mature product is? And um, I think that uh, in, the same, in that same uh, Oregon public policy session, Ben Barry said, you know, there's like 140,000 products. How do you choose the right ones? So looking on that, it was clear that there was a clear need for an open source evaluation methodology. How do you figure out which products are mature enough for you? And I want to be sure that I respect our time. What, what time is this session supposed to be concluded? Four. 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 Okay, good. All right, so let's talk about you know, why companies are turning to open source. Um, from the vendor perspective, I talked a little bit about this. You know, the old enterprise business model is kind of just exhausted. You, they can't, let me just say, they blame you, the end user. You're just not buying the way you used to, and they don't like it. And it's just kind of exhausting. You can't hire enough expensive salespeople to get people to buy the stuff anymore. So that's kind of the old model's broken. They like it because it gets them to market a lot faster. If they incorporate open source components into their products, they can get their product out faster, which helps them. Um, reduces their cost. They're not paying licensing fees to third-party software providers that they have to then bundle into their product. 
it enables them to focus on what they really do well. They don't have to write everything, so they don't have to put effort into creating things that you know, are a lot of work to make, but don't really give them much advantage. I mean, just to give you an example, most companies love the fact they can take the Apache web server and just put that into their product because they don't, they're not that good at writing one. They don't really want to write one. And frankly, nobody is going to give you extra money as a vendor because you've got a web server. So they just use the Apache web server. So it helps them focus on their core competency. And it reduces their distribution and adoption uh, costs across time and geographical constraints. You can put an open source product out there and have people downloading it and using it in countries that you wouldn't be able to get to as a business for six months, 12 months, two years. For example, Sugar CRM, which is an open source CRM product, put their product out and something like within a week they had eight or 10 different languages already translated. As a company, to get that kind of translation coverage, you have to invest a lot of money, form relationships with translators, a lot of work. That meant that people could start using um, Sugar CRM in countries like Germany and Romania and all kinds of places that Sugar CRM didn't have to, um, would never have been able to reach to. So that's a real advantage from the vendor perspective. From the end user perspective, cost. And uh, interestingly, I think in, in Andrea's uh, presentation, what he said was that that's probably the number one driver for commercial organizations, maybe not so much for governmental. But I will say that, I, you know, in my experience, cost is a huge driver for adopting open source. And many of the things that people talk about in terms of other characteristics, if you look down below what that characteristic means, it ends up being cost. So things like, it gives me less vendor lock-in. Well, that's another way of saying, that's going to reduce my overall cost because my, I don't, a vendor won't have me over the barrel and kind of say, well, this year I'm going to charge you more because you're locked in. Uh, flexibility you know, gives you the opportunity to respond to your changing business conditions. Um, a great example of that is the DHS here. Isn't it DHS, Department of Health Services? Department of Human Services, that had a mandate from, I think it was Medicare or something like that, that said, you've got to start doing some kind of new billing thing or something like that. And they said, how are we going to do that? It's going to take us six months to figure out what we need to do. We'll have to send, you know, get a budget. Then we're going to have to send an RFP. You know, we're not going to be able to do this for a year and a half. A guy went home over the weekend, downloaded Sugar CRM, played around with it, and came in Monday with a prototype of what they needed to do. And they were up and running within, you know, just a few weeks. And so flexibility is a real advantage of open source. Time to market, maybe not as big a concern for governmental agencies, but certainly commercial companies, you know, get some kind of a, you know, um, we need to roll a new product out or we need to offer a new service or something like that. Open source lets them get going on that a lot faster. But really that DHS example I think is a good one. They had, you know, time to market maybe is the wrong thing, but time to mandate maybe is a good way to say it. Um, try before you buy. This is a real benefit. I was talking about the flip side, which is you, um, you, know, you sort of have to evaluate it yourself. And the vendor doesn't do so much work. But the flip side of that is, and I'm sure none of you have ever, ever experienced this, but sometimes vendors come out and tell you their product does things, and it really doesn't really do that. But you only find out after you've bought the, paid for the contract, and you put it in, and, you, and then you call them up, and they go, oh, yeah. What we really meant, that was kind of a verb tense thing. What we really meant to say was, it will do that someday. Well, so open source gives you the opportunity to try it before you buy it. You can download it and try it and make sure it does what you want. Huge, huge benefit. Lack of lock-in, which is great. You're not over the barrel with a vendor. You can customize it, which depending on the kind of organization you are and your skill set, can be a real benefit. You can say, this is a great product, but it doesn't do quite what I need because I have a certain law or regulation, you have the opportunity to change it. And then one that doesn't get talked about a lot around open source, you hear the discussion about community as kind of an abstract thing, but one of the real benefits of open source is being able to collaborate with the community. You can run into a problem and you can say, has anybody else run into this kind of a problem? And you, know, you have an opportunity to work with others. So you don't have to go through the vendor. And kind of in, a, in terms of a communication model, the proprietary model is kind of what I call a hub and a spoke kind of thing. There may be a lot of users, but each of you basically has to go to the vendor to ask, you know, how do I do this? You know, is there a way to do this or something? With um, 
open source is more of a grid kind of a model. You can reach, you can bypass the vendor, if there even is a vendor, or whatever, and go directly to other users and say, how can we do this? Is there a way we can work together? Has somebody created a tutorial that I can use? This is a huge benefit. And, and frankly, from my own personal experience, this was the key thing that really showed me about open source was collaboration. Um, as I mentioned, we were doing that project that we got called in because they spent all the money. And um, so we were doing this stuff and running into some problems, as you always do, doing technical stuff. We'd post a question to the forum. Within 20 minutes, we had answers back from Czechoslovakia and Australia. People saying, oh yeah, we did it. We ran into that. Here's how you solve it. Here's a code fragment. Here's how to go do it. The guys, uh, the other part group that was doing, my colleagues who were doing the proprietary implementation, ran into a problem called up the vendor and said, I got a problem. How do I do this? The first thing they got was someone who let, knew less about the product than they did, right? The first line of support. They finally got it. Um, it took two days. Actually, that wasn't the first thing. The first thing they got was somebody saying, you're not in the support database, so I can't take your call. After they got that squared away after a couple of days, they got somebody who knew less about the product than they did. About two weeks later, they finally got the answer back. They said, oh yeah, what you've run into, yeah, that's a problem. And the way to solve it is you have to upgrade to the next version. And you know that'll be extra money. My point isn't to slam them. My point is that was a real evidence for me about the, the power of collaborating with the community. And that's a real, a real benefit. Let's talk about, OK, that all sounds great. But what do you worry about in terms of open source? What are the things you have to worry about? On the vendor side, license compliance. Am I doing what the license requires? There's a concern with some of them on viral licenses. You know, is something going to infect my product and all of a sudden I'm going to have to be giving away products? Um, product decisions made without technical and managerial review. In other words, an engineer has just made a critical architectural decision for our product, committing us to a long-term uh, road that nobody else knows about. Right? Nobody else reviewed that decision. Um, ability to provide customer support. You know, there's nothing worse than getting a call that says, I have a problem with my, with my product that you're supposed to support. And you go look around and you go, oh my god, there's, pro there's stuff in our software that we didn't know what it is. How are we going to support that? And then inconsistent decision making. You know, in other words, this part of the organization really evaluates what we're going to do with the product. This other part, it's Bob down the hall. That instinctively makes people uncomfortable. Why aren't we doing things in a consistent way? From the perspective of end user, which I think is more representative in this audience, obviously still license compliance. Am I doing the right things with the license? Am I adhering to all of its conditions? And you know, I talked about the flexibility and the benefits and the expansiveness of those licenses, open source licenses. They also carry responsibilities. There are things that you have to do if you want to take advantage of the open source. And it's ethically and legally important to do that. The next two are a little different for end users than vendors, but really critical, which is product proliferation and, and version proliferation. I think I need to find a different word to, use to talk about that, but because I don't pronounce it very well. But the point is, you've got an entire IT infrastructure. If people are just saying, I'm going to download this product and put it into this project, you can end up with three different web servers, or four different content management systems, or a couple of different databases. And the thing that that does is that has the impact of raising your operational costs because you have to have a skill set sufficient to cover all those products. And you've got to be able to be responsive to, to support those things. And so without a way to evaluate and select products, you know, you can run into problems with you've got too much of a richness of open source. IT decisions made without technical manager or same kind of thing, right? Somebody decided to put this product into our infrastructure and nobody else knew about it. That's obviously not good. And then inconsistent decision making. I will say that within this audience, a government audience, there's something else on top of this, a risk factor that you know, is, is present, which is you have the, um, if I can say it, the opportunity to always have the political process intrude into your stuff. And you know, I think that the, old, the whole uh, situation in Massachusetts is very instructive. They went through a very formal evaluation process. They established criteria. Everything was great until they announced the decision. And then all of a sudden, they had you know, kind of state senators saying, well, wait a second, you know, and kind of poking in there. 
And so um, I think particularly for governmental agencies, it's important to have an, uh, an established process that's verifiable, that's impartial, that you can point to and say, hey, we didn't just pull this out of the air. In terms of open source risk, what I always talk about with organizations is you have a couple of different dimensions to think about. One is legal and regulatory exposure. So in other words, licenses. And there's other aspects of that as well, regulatory things like, you know, healthcare records. You know, are you treating this the software? Can you have an audit trail of what you've installed, what versions you've got, all those kinds of things. So those aren't just legal in the sense of licenses, the open source licenses and compliance, but a whole range of regulatory and legal kinds of implications that have impact on your um, legal and regulatory side. But then you have also operational dependency. And I was talking about that in terms of things like version pr proliferation or product proliferation. But if you think about it, as your open source usage goes into more and more important systems, production type systems, your operational exposure becomes higher. Because if a, if a system that you use once in a while to you know, make a presentation crashes, OK, great. You know, um, we'll wait till tomorrow, and maybe it'll reboot. But you know, if you've got a system that basically is doing something that you have to do once a month, once a month reporting to the federal government, or you know. God forbid, once a month checks out to um, someone, and that crashes, you don't have the kind of, well, we'll just wait till tomorrow and hope it works. Right? So you have much more operational exposure. And so depending on your legal and regulatory exposure and your operational dependency, you know, your open source risk profile is higher or lower. And obviously, the higher it is, the more thorough and more careful you have to be. Now, we talk a lot about balancing risk and reward. And I have a different perspective. My perspective is we want to have that as big an imbalance as possible, where the risk is as small as possible and the benefits are as large as possible. This is the Greek god, I think it's Themis, who became the Roman god Elustus. Elustius. Do you know anything about this, uh, Andre? Well, Eleusius is the, is the um, god of justice, and, uh, or goddess, I should say. And what she does is, this is to balance up the, the, way, the claims of the differing parties. And you want to come to a balance where you've balanced their things. But in terms of open source, you want to imbalance risk and reward. You want to reduce your risk as much as possible and achieve all those benefits that uh, we outlined in terms of flexibility and cost and lack of lock-in and so forth. So the question is, how can you do that? How can you reduce? your risks. And in terms of an open source best practices, what we talk about with organizations is basically three different uh, categories. Organization, process, and community. All of these are important within open source. Underlying all of them is an open source policy. What is you know, our rules of engagement with open source? And um, I'm doing a workshop tomorrow on, on this topic. How do you create and roll out an open source policy within your organization. So I don't want to uh, talk a lot about that right now, but this is really critical to have in place. And then based on that, over here you've got your license policy and your architecture and product policy, which is kind of how you decide what to use and so forth. What we're talking about here is the open source maturity model. This is part of your process, your engineering process. How do you actually decide what products you're going to use? When I set out to create an evaluation methodology, what I realized was that it was, it was not going to be workable if you came to people and said, oh, all the ways you've always thought about doing products, throw all that out, because open source is different. I mean, organizations just don't want to have kind of a, oh yeah, we have this model for everything else we do, and this model for open source. So I wanted something that really would uh, integrate with already existing ways of thinking about evaluating products and already existing budget categories. Because if you have a, if you sort of say, this is a way you do things, but by the way, it doesn't fit with any of the way you fund things now or any of the buckets you um, spend money on, again, a non starter. It had to be cost effective and time efficient for organizations. And most important, it had to come out with an evaluation result that you can kind of go, okay, this tells me. This product is mature or not mature or how mature it is. 
I don't think it's useful to come out with something that says, I think it's pretty good. I mean, what can you do with that in terms of organization? So, and you know, kind of at the bottom line was, I wanted to create a system that someone like, how many project managers or people who shepherd projects in this audience? I wanted something that you could take into a meeting with your senior management, explain that you wanted to use an open source product, explain the evaluation system that you were using, present your results on the product you wanted to use, and get a decision all within an hour. Because that's essentially the time scale we all work on. And you know the way these kinds of things go is if you don't get it in within an hour, it might take you another two months or three months to get on the agenda. So it was like a kind of a one hour um, uh, uh, evaluation methodology that you could present. It takes more than an hour to do, but you could present it and get a decision within an hour. And here's kind of the open source maturity model. As you'll notice down the side are the categories that kind of that align with the way you already think about using products within your organizations. So the software itself. I mean, obviously, this is really critical. What goes into software? Well, let me talk about the other categories. Support, obviously quite important. Documentation. This is um, an area that um, most people who create open source software don't worry about very much because they figure, you know, you already have, you know, you know, you'll figure out how to do it. But end users of mainstream organizations worry about documentation a lot. And I'll tell you a, a kind of a, a, a very a way that really crystallized this for me was I was presenting this. I was at Google presenting this, and was talking about the importance of documentation. And somebody st stuck his head up, hand up. I said yes, and he said, "Why do I have to? Why do I need documentation? I can just go read the code." I said, "Thank you, Mr. Early Adopter." Google hires people who can go read the code and have enough time and all that. Most organizations, people are time compressed. They don't maybe bring expertise around that. They just want to be able to look it up and get an answer, right? So documentation is really key. Training, another important thing. Product integrations. How well can I get this to work with the rest of my existing software stack? No product ever goes in and says, it stands alone, it works alone, it never has to share data. It's just as a one stand by itself system. So product integrations are really important. And then services. Um, depending on the organization, services can be, depending on the end user organization, services can be very important or very unimportant. But it's, in, it's important to evaluate this availability of services for a given product for two reasons. One, you might want to be using it, those services. You might want to say, we need to bring in some outside help. But two, the availability of professional services for an open source product is a very important signal about its community and about its maturity. Because typically, you don't start to see service organizations springing up around products until there's a pretty significant community and usage base. And as someone who's evaluating, should I commit to this product, that's a very important um, factor. In terms of the product software, what are the things that go in there? Well, obviously, functionality. And that's a really key thing. And I'll come back to that in just a second. But beyond that, you have um, quality. What is the quality of the software? What is the longevity of the software? How long has it been around? That's another key thing. And then finally, what's the quality of the development team, the development organization? And how well is that in place? Because those are all key things for, from the perspective of using an open source product. In terms of functionality, the model puts a lot of emphasis on that because at the end of the day, you're evaluating this product not in the abstract. You're evaluating it. How well will it solve my problem? I need software to come in and do something. Here are my requirements. And so I think it's really important for the product to be evaluated in light of the requirements. Because otherwise, you know, what good does it know, do you to know, oh, this is a, this is a mature product? If it's not what you need, right? I mean, uh, yes. So does the security play a part in the maturity model? Security does. It's part of evaluating the functionality. I consider security part and parcel of the product and its functionality. Um, I know some people sort of say, say, "Well, security is a separate thing that I have to evaluate." I've always felt if it's separate from the rest of the product, there's something wrong with with that. You know, it ought to be baked in. It ought to be part of it. And it's also part of the quality. 
but it's definitely addressed in that. <coughs> um, so functionality fits into there. And basically there's three phases. Every one of these of these of these product elements, you figure out what are my requirements. And so obviously functionality I just talked about. You know, what is what do I need it to do? What does it, you know, capability does it have to have? What does it need to be able to store? What do I need to be able to retrieve? Um, you set requirements for support. Different organizations have different comfort levels around support. Obviously Google, very comfortable supporting themselves. Lots of other organizations, you know, don't want to be, don't want to have geniuses on staff for the product. They want to be able to reach out. And so you might say, what's available in terms of support? Is there community support? How good is it? And there's ways to evaluate. The, 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 my book, Succeeding with Open Source, really is basically a tutorial about how to use the open source maturity model. It shows you know, 10 or 15 different ways you can evaluate the quality support. You can do things like look at the forums. How quickly do they answer questions? How thoroughly do they answer questions? How responsive are they? How friendly are they? Right? Because you don't want to be posting a question to a forum and the answer comes back, you're such an idiot for asking this question. Right? Because that ends up not being a very good vehicle for support. But you might also say, I want commercial support. What commercial op uh, offerings are there for support? Is there a place that I can contract with for support? Documentation I talked about. Training. This is, again, an area where requirements can really vary. There are some organizations that training is basically buy a book and read it on your own time. Maybe none of you are in that kind of organization, but there are organizations like that. In fact, um, when I first came out with this, do we have any corrections people in the uh, audience? OK, well, this is kind of a correction story. So uh, the, um, uh, I got a call right after the book came out. And a woman from the Kansas, you're not from Kansas, are you? OK. The, a, book, a woman from the Kansas Department of Corrections said, wow, this is great. We're interested in doing open source. We really want a methodology. This is really great. You know, and we're really excited. Um, you know, how can we go about, about applying it? And so I thought she was ta calling up to say, you know, are there consulting services around how to do it and so forth? And I started to say, well, you know, I'm, you know, there's this and you know, what do you have in mind? She goes, well, you know, we're the De Kansas Department of Corrections. We don't necessarily just buy books for any reason. So for them, buying the book and telling them to look at, read it at night, that was too much of an expense. They they for them, twenty five dollars was the ceiling, in terms of of training. I just thought, my God, <laughs> she was, it's like the book's too expensive. Um, we don't. By contrast, the U.S. military, you know, is very formal training. They don't let anybody just go do something. I mean, before they'll let you do anything, they will send you through a training class. And so for them, the availability of formal training programs for an open source product is very critical. So evaluating the kind of training. So defining your requirements. You do this for all of these things. Locate the resources. If I'm, if I'm interested in training and I want um, formal training, training, classroom availability kind of training. This talks about how do you go find out if it's available. You know, where do you search? How would you go find it and so forth. So you do the locate the resources. And that's for all of these different things. Then you assess the maturity. And that means if I need in-person, in-classroom training, how is there any available and how good is it? Because it's not enough just that there's somebody says, oh yeah, I do training on Apache. The question is, how good is that training? Because if the training is available, but it's terrible training, it's really not very mature, is it? And it's not very helpful. And then out of that comes assigning an element score. And it's, a, it's very simple. The score is 0 to 10. So all you have to do is come up with a number between 0 and 10. The second phase is assigning a weighting factor. And if you think about this, some of these are more important than others, right? For example, support is probably more important than training. Because if the product is supported terribly, you're going to reject it. So training's how important is training, right? Or if the product doesn't do what you need it to do, the fact that it's well integrated with other products is irrelevant. And so there's a weighting factor. And I'll be showing a slide with the default weighting factors. And then you calculate the product maturity score. And essentially that's taking the element score, 
0 to 10, multiplying it by the weighting factor, and coming up with a number. And guess what? All the weighting factors add up to 10. So the, multiple, the total possible score is 10. The weighting factors add up to 10. The scale is 0 to 100. So that makes it very easy to come out with that concrete number that gives you a maturity level. The maturity level is 63 or 75 or 52 or whatever it is. And remember, the whole goal of this is to come up with something that's verifiable, that can be described, can be, um, and got a, a decision all within the course of an hour. And there's nothing like that than to say, we did the evaluation and it's got a maturity score of 73. So here's the default element weightings. So this is basic, this is the software, this is the support, and these. So it all adds up to 10. Depending on your organization, you may modify these. So these are default, suggested, but you are more than welcome to change those according to your desires. And so for example, some organizations, professional services might be more important. You know, um, organizations that outsource a lot of their IT, obviously the fact that somebody else out there can deal with the product is very important. And so professional services will be bumped up to maybe a three. All you have to do is make sure that the weighting factors sum to 10. So if you bump one up, something else has to come down because it's got to be remain on 100 uh, on a normalized scale of 100 so you can do comparisons. Because one of the things you, you might want to do is say, we're interested in two products. Let's evaluate both of them and see what their comparative maturity is. And so you want to have it normalized on a scale of 100 because what you don't want to do is have one that came out with 73 on a scale of 100 and another one that came out at 73 on a scale of 80 because then what do you say, what do we do? And there's recommended minimum maturity scores. So you, because the obvious question is, well, it came out to 73, great, what does that tell me? Well, so in terms of recommended minimum maturity scores, early adopters, which are the organizations on the left-hand side of that chasm that I talked about, that Gregory Moore chasm, they're the people who are looking for um, competitive advantage. They typically are willing to live with less mature products, I mean, by definition. Pragmatists are the organizations on the right-hand side of the chasm that want more mature, more whole products, easier to consume products. Guess what? They need higher scores. And then, of course, you have different purposes. Remember the risk profile goes up as you move toward production? Well, the, the recommended minimum maturity scores recognize that and recommend higher maturity scores as you become more dependent on the <coughs> on the use of the product. So they, re they vary according to use and organization type. So what should you take away from today before you ask questions, which I um, will help you uh, also take stuff away. I, I can't say this enough. I mean, I preach this all the time. Open source is transforming the landscape of IT. I live in Silicon Valley. What I can tell you is there are no companies being funded today that do not have an open source strategy in, in, as part of their stuff. So in other words, that helps them create their products. So maybe it's components. Maybe they pursue an open source strategy. Or it really is what they use to deliver it. And so all these software as a service companies, basically they're all driven, they're all powered by open source. They have to be for them to be able to offer their services at the kind of price points they do. So open source is transforming IT. It is going to push into your organizations. As an end user organization, you don't have a choice about we're going to use open source or not. I still occasionally run into, well actually not even that occasionally, I still run into organizations that go, we don't use open source or we're not going to use open source. That, you know, that is, a, that is an attitude that it will overwhelm you. It will push in because the economics are just so compelling. Current IT processes are not adequate to manage open source. We talked about this in the Oregon uh, open source policy stuff. I mean, they're, essentially they're stuck right now because they want to create RFPs and they want to have people to respond and it's, that is the established process and it just breaks down within open source. And so you've got to have something, you've got to have a way to respond to that. It's not enough to just say, well, this is the way we do business. We want the world to work that way. The world's changing. And so the current IT processes need to be modified. And using the evaluation method methodology can reduce that operational risk.
Somebody wants an answer on something. Um, and so, and having something that's a, you know, a formalized approach that's a process, that's impartial, that can be applied, is a tremendous benefit within your organizations because you can use it to judge your projects, to sell your projects, and so forth. But it's also important within the government because you know, as you want to be able to justify to um, the political process or other vendors, hey, we had, we, we didn't just pull this decision out of our hat. We did an evaluation and we did a methodology. All right, so that's the open source maturity model, a way to evaluate open source products, evaluate and assess products. Questions? I realize this is a very tough time because I'm standing between you and the reception. So, but uh, any questions, um, I'd be more than happy to address them. Yes? Um, t tell me more about what you mean by the so, skills. So, um, so whoever is, is following this methodology, I think the first stumbling block is just hearing those terms, PHP or hearing Ruby and stuff like that. It's like, we don't have those skills. We are not going to go even this step of going through this exercise. So where does that part play? Where, how do we overcome that block? Well, I mean, my uh, initial re response or my initial reaction is what you're really saying is, you know, our skill set in terms of a technology isn't capable. And so if I were recommending what I, what I would do is say, we need an open source product that's based on a technology that we're familiar with. So that goes into your functional requirements. We want something that's written in Java. Let's just say you have Java skills. Or we want something that's written in C. I, I think if you sort of say, we want something written in COBOL, you're going to have problems. Not very many open source COBOL projects. But that would be a really important requirement for you. Or you'd have to sort of say, you know, we're very interested in using this product. It's going to require a skill set. We need to really move forward on our training side. So that would be a requirement into your training. Before you get trained on the product, maybe you have to get trained on PHP. So that's, that's how I would go about it. Um, you know, but I think that this, in a way, isn't an open source problem per se. It's a new technology problem that you face no matter what. I, 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 I do a blog for CIO Magazine on open source, and I wrote something, and a guy responded saying, you know, <coughs> open source sucks because, you know, if I need a Windows programmer, I can just call up a recruiter and, you know, they got a zillion of them. But when I want Linux, I can't find them anywhere. Well, um, as uh, in one of my previous jobs, I, I worked for a database company. I worked for Informix software. I don't know if anybody's familiar with Informix. But my group put Informix software on Windows NT, the first release of the Windows Server product. We were the first commercial database product put on that. Okay, I'm not saying that to brag. But I'll tell you something. When you needed a Windows programmer then, you didn't call up a recruiter for them because there weren't any. You had to basically go beat the bushes and you know, network and all that. Anytime a new technology comes out, the skills aren't there. And so you have to have a, a look for them. So this isn't, just, this isn't specific to open source. This is specific to any new technology rolling into an organization. So that's, that's what I'd say about that. I mean, if you want to bring up, if you want to you know, incorporate a product based on PHP, I mean, I think you're going to have to evaluate what's it going to take for us to get skills in that, in that area. Um, but I also want to say, the world isn't nearly as tough as this guy who responded to my blog posting. You can find Linux people lots of different places. I don't care what he, but he was in Indiana or something like that. Maybe it's tougher in Indiana. <laughs> yeah? So does your evaluation methodology differ between public sector and private sector? Like, do you recommend different weightings? Or, you know, what, what are the differences in how public sector and state and local government should evaluate open source? I, I don't differentiate between them because I think that you know they face now I mean their requirements coming in may be somewhat different and that's in this you know the first thing where you set your requirements they may say you know we need certain kinds of training or it's got to integrate with our legacy system or something like that um, just before um, our session here there's a number of people attending the conference from other countries and so Deb put together like a little um, caucus of people from different countries. 
And uh, there's several people from Malaysia here. And interestingly, one of them said, oh, by the way, um, we use your open source maturity model in our governmental um, open source policy. We recommend that people use that as a way to assess the products. So you know, they had no problem applying it into the governmental sector. Other questions? I saw a hand go up, but it was the guy running the video. All right, well, I can tell that I'm standing between you and the drinks, and, which is an uncomfortable position to be in. So thanks very much. If you have other questions, I'll be, happy. I'll be here for a few minutes, and certainly I'll be at the uh, event as well. Thanks.